We're going to be looking at a new book together in the Bible, uh, just for the foreseeable future, i.e. until the point that I think you've had enough of it, I've had, no, no, up to I think God says that's enough. And I'm really excited about this book. I'm really pleased we're going to be looking into it. Um, it is going to be, no, I don't want it up yet to me. I, I want to see people know this one really well. It's uh, really, its true title is The Things Left Out. So if you can turn to it, please. No, okay, it, it's quite well known. I mean, I'm sure you read it tons. Um, I, I, thanks to the Christian scholar Jerome, we actually know it as Chronicles. You're all like, Chronicles? Well, we know it as one and two chronicles, but originally it was just chronicles. It was all one hit. It was never broken up. It was just one big book. Probably the most famous verse. Anybody? Probably the one that you use the most out of it all the time. We hear it quite often. I'll give you a clue. One chronicles. And I think Liz has got it really well, so I'm going to come running to her. I saw her mouth. I'm hoping that wasn't anything rude. <laughs> yeah, but change it quick. Yeah. Uh, if my people... Yep. Yeah. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from on high and heal their land and sing the rest with me. Excellent. You know that one? 1 Chronicles 7.14. I bet, other than that, that's probably the only one you know, and it may be one other that you might well have sort of extrapolated back in about the year 2000. Do you remember that, all of 17 years ago? I was clearly very young then. We can tell that by my mum's birth date. Um, which is the prayer of... Begins with J, not Jesus. That's Old Testament. Prayer of? No? J Baz? Does anybody remember that? The prayer of J Baz? If, Lord, please do not give me any trouble, ext extend my territory. Do you know? It was a massive industry. When it came out, when the author wrote on it, and I'm going to use that phrase, it was massive industry. It was like... You know all these wristbands like WWJD? It was exactly the same thing. The guy had mugs and... But the idea was about... And he, he, he based this entire... I'm not knocking it, I'm just stating a fact. An entire book was based around this obscure few verses in chapter 5 of 1 Chronicles. That's about all you'll know Chronicles for, yeah? There's another reason you'll know Chronicles. It's because for the first nine chapters... Can we have it up, please, Timmy, now? Thank you very much. It's commonly known as the genealogies. It's a long list of names. And people tend to not know Chronicles. There's, don't take this the wrong way, my brothers and sisters, but there's a lot of blank faces looking at me. Now, it could be that you're just going, please, can we just go to sleep? Or it could be the fact you're going, we hardly look at Chronicles. That would be true of most Christians today. That would be true of actually a lot of scholarship around Chronicles from Christians. We tend not to look at Chronicles because it just seems to be filling in the gaps of 1 and 2 and 1 and, one and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. And we don't really look at it. And especially when you've got genealogies of nine chapters of this. It doesn't exactly make riveting reading, does it? Having trouble sleeping? <coughs> Read this. <coughs> Guaranteed. <You're not> well. <laughs> We're going to get there, don't worry, John. <laughs> We're going to get there. Now, if we was reading the authorised version, it would say a lot of begats. So-and-so begat so-and-so. And after a while, you'll be going, I'm going to begat you in a minute, Pastor Warren, if you don't be quiet. But it can sound really boring 
and you'll think, how does this relate to us? Well, if you bear with, we might find God talking to us in the process. So, first of all, quick background check. Author, unknown. More than likely, authors, <coughs> plural. More than likely, collectors of various records to bring together this one compilation. It's like a history check. Oh, there's some gaps in 1 and 2 Samuel. There's some gaps in 1 and 2 Kings. Let's fill in the gaps and put it in 1 and 2 Chronicles, yeah? But it's not history as we think we understand history now. We tend to think of history of absolute facts, yes? Pin down, no editing, no redaction. These are the facts, as clear as day about history, yeah? Who's been watching the recent advertisement of the film uh, uh, about Queen Victoria? Yeah? yeah? Who knew that she had this, this uh, Sikh uh, Asian friend in her court? Who knew that from history? I didn't. Do you know why? Because, again, it's history that's been redacted. Probably been removed, and to use a, a Hollywood term that they're using at the moment, and I would humbly suggest this, probably history over the years in the West has white washed him out. Don't like the idea of maybe somebody else being in Victorian times who's non-white. <laughs> Notice I don't agree with that. We need to have history as it is. But we actually all redact history. Redact as in reduce it down. We take out the bits we don't like. If you've ever had an argument with someone, yeah? <laughs> Carol, my sister, we'll, we'll pray for you later for lying. Frank, oh, well done, mate, for keeping silent. Uh, but you ever have an argument with someone? I can, I can guarantee you, when everybody's retelling me an argument they've had with someone, and if I'm ever retelling an argument I've had with Joy, I'll miss out bits to make me look better. And we all do that, don't we, Carol? <laughs> so, anyway, history as we understand it, we don't do that well. And here in 1 Chronicles also, it, it actually differs from certain parts in the rest of the Bible. You go, well, hang on a minute, that's, that's not how 1 Kings tells that story. But it's because the authors are trying to show us something as part of the thing. They're not trying to make themselves look good, but they're trying to come out with a core central message, okay? And that's the point. So you have to, when you read this, we have to take that into account. So actually that makes the genealogies, believe it or not, exciting in a minute. You with me so far? When was it written? Debated, latest scholarship, about 332 B.C., Written for whom? Well, written for the Jewish nation who've now returned back from exile. So they've been in Babylon, Babylon exile. God kicked them out because they disobeyed God. It's all well known, the split. This is them sort of, not all of them are returned back to Jerusalem, but this is a few generations down the line. They have returned. And it's written from them. But why? Well, we're going to look at a quick breakdown, if you're up for it. Excuse me, do apologise, bear with me a second. Could you just mute me for a second, please, Subana? Could you mute me? Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, had the flu jab on Friday. Just haven't got the flu. You can't get the flu with the flu jab, but I'm just feeding the symptoms slightly. So... Let's go from back, let's go from the end to the beginning. You ready? 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 33, all the way back to 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 1. That is going to tell us about King Rehoboam to the restoration from Babylon in exile. Okay, so the exile's coming back to Babylon. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 31, right backwards to 1 Chronicles 10, 1. That's looking at the reigns of King David and King Solomon. That's a lot of chapters right in the middle, just on two men. 
That's telling you something about why Chronicles was written. It's focusing on King David and King Solomon. What are the chroniclers? That's what we're going to call them, by the way, the authors. Chroniclers. What are they trying to tell us? And then 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 30, 44, all the way back to 1 Chronicles 1, 1, is going to basically be from their restoration in Babylon again, all the way back to, oh, can anybody read the name? Adam. Adam. So, why Adam? Well, in Matthew chapter 1, have you ever read it? Matthew chapter 1. Please tell me we've read Matthew chapter 1. It's like I've read Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and went no further. But Matthew chapter 1, as we all know, Matthew, when he wrote that, started with this. This is the record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, and he goes on. The idea, he's making connections with Jesus. Lineage. <laughs> connections. Luke chapter 3. If you've never really looked at Luke chapter 3, that really goes on. He literally says, Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. Jesus was known as the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Helah. Helah was the son of Matat. Matat was the son of Levi. Levi was the son of, and it keeps going, until we get to the end when it says, and then Seth was the son of Adam. Adam was the son of God. Lineage. Here we have. Adam was were Seth, Enos, the descendants of Adam were Seth, Enos, Kenan, and you can pronounce the rest. Lineage shows connection, family trees. Ever done your family tree? Who's ever got their family tree done, seen it, somebody did it? My dad did ours. He's done all the work, I'll just accept it, thanks very much. Did you ever see Who Do You Think You Are? The BBC show? Yeah, the other Baptist church, remember? BBC, Baptist church, yeah. <laughs> My best one ever was Sir Matthew Clive Pinsent. Was born 10th of October, 1970. It's four days between us, quite nice. Um, you know the English are Matthew Pinsent? Yeah, okay, cool. Broadcaster, during his rowing career, won 10 World Championship gold medals and four consecutive Olympic gold medals. But during Who Do You Think You Are, he discovered he was a descendant of William the Conqueror. It's quite something, isn't it? It's got quite a lineage. And then what happens after that, when you then go back with the kings, they eventually descend themselves back to God. That's what kings did then for their history. It wasn't true, clearly, but you know what I mean? So what we have here is the chronicler trying to show the people have returned back from exile in all these nine chapters of history, to sort of say, you are part of Israel's history. You've got a pedigree of heritage. Your heritage is amazing. Your ancestry goes all the way back to Adam. It's quite something, isn't it? Don't forget, they're exiled. They've been in exile. They feel displaced. They don't really know a lot. You know, these are generations, hundreds of years down the line. You've been cast out from your land that you, you know, that is meant to be where God rests. And then you've come back years later and you're, you're not part of the original generation that got kicked out. So all you've done is heard their stories. It, you know what I mean? It doesn't connect so well, does it? And so this chronicler is trying to say you're part of these generations so when you do your family tree we tend to start at the beginning don't we me you start with me first don't you and then you work your way back it's called a family tree for a reason trees grow don't they anybody seen a tree grow good that's all right then they can turn out to be really magnificent things, can't they? 
But they don't start with the leaf, do they? And work their way back. Which actually in a family tree, that's what we do. We start with the leaf, I us, and we work our way back. But actually a tree starts from its roots, doesn't it? From its central trunk. And then it grows, and it's from that trunk all the branches come off, don't they? And all the twigs. And eventually, we at the moment are the leaves, or a little bit of a tr twig. I like the idea of me being a twig, I feel slimmer. <laughs> but anyway. You see, and here in Chronicles, they start with the trunk. Adam. They don't start with where they are now at 322 BC. They start right back at the beginning of time. And they start right from the first man and say, from this trunk, check you out, folks. If you've ever done your tree, have you ever got excited about when you've looked back and gone, oh, wow, I didn't know I was descended from somebody like that? Oh, that makes a bit more of a connection now with. I'm bound to be corrected by my mum in a moment, but I'm fairly sure somewhere back in my history, we're connected with somebody who actually, this sounds awful, but died in the Somme. Thank you, my mum's nodding at me, I'm all right. I've remembered something. But the point being, First World War really had no major connection emotionally until I discovered that. It has that connection, doesn't it? You suddenly feel slightly part of it. It has made Remembrance Day for me a little bit more more meaningful. Yeah, thanks, Carol. Yeah, do you understand? So actually, here, within these chronicles, starting with Adam, it sort of says you're starting from the beginning, folks. And then they read the whole of this, all the way through. So, you ready? The descendants of Adam were Seth, Enos, Kenan, Malala, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. The sons of Noah were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, you expect me to read the Bible that I'm preaching on, don't you? You expect me to read the passage to which I'm preaching on, yes? Okay, all nine chapters. The descendants of Japheth were Goma, Madog, Madog. You're all worried that I'm going to keep going, aren't you? <laughs> I'm not. You'll be pleased to know. But when you read all of that, there is a point you start thinking, oh my life. A, the na names start becoming unpronounceable, especially if you've got English that's as bad as mine. Then there's a point it does become tiring and it does cure insomnia. insomnia. Don't say that God doesn't heal. But when you read it, you start getting connections going on. And you're thinking... Wow, from this pedigree, do we come? But it sort of then spurs off a little bit, real quick. There's some key things. I'd like to go to verse 10, if you wouldn't mind, please, Timmy. Could you just take us to verse 10? Thanks very much. Cush was also the ancestor of Nimrod, who was the first heroic warrior on earth. Get excited? And you'll get these moments in Chronicles where they suddenly just give a bit of extra information. Well, what's Chronicles trying to tell us? Why would you suddenly mention, this is the first time it's sort of done a quick spurn off to tell us about somebody called Nimrod. By the way, that's why, you know, the RAF calls their plane the Nimrod. It's because of this. Just thought you'd like to know. Um, why has he done that? Well, because he's actually pointing eventually. Do you remember when I said in the centre is... King David, what is King David known as? The warrior king. He's trying to point out some connections. His chronicle starting to sound a little bit more exciting. My sermon may not be, but his chronicle starting to sound. <laughs> yeah? Okay, there is connections here. Amazing connections. Verse 28, please, Timmy. Sorry to make you jump to... I'm just, I'm just dipping in and out. 
The sons of Abraham were Isaac and Ishmael. Right, bear in mind, the Chronicles is writing this. When they put this together, they're expecting the Jewish people to know their history. Yeah? So, the sons of Abraham were Isaac and Ishmael. Now, notice, for a starter, wrong way round. Because really, Ishmael was the firstborn of Isaac, wasn't he? But he wasn't the one that God wanted. As in God saying, but that's not who I'm going to make you numerous for. It's not through that son that I'm going to make it. It's Isaac, yes? So it's interesting they have swapped it round deliberately. That's to give Isaac priority. When well, we all do it, don't we? I know in my family, you know, I'm the eldest. And then there's my brother. He's taller than me. Much better looking. But still, my name goes first. So, they've done this here deliberately. But they have not left Ishmael out. They have not left e Ishmael out. And then literally, verse 29, look. These are the genealogical records the sons of Ishmael were. And then they go on about the sons of Ishmael. Not left him out. What they're saying is within the tree branch, there is still this connection. Israel, you know, you can't ignore the, the, the descendants of Ishmael. Now, they may not have the direct covenant, but they are still connected to you as a family. That's what the chronicle is trying to show. And maybe um, in certain uh, uh, situations that are happening in, uh, in other areas currently, maybe some of the people who might trace their roots back to sort of the Arab historic nations back then, they might want to have a look and say, ah, maybe they are our ancestors as well. If you watch the BBC News, I won't go on any more. You can't ignore these people. They are part of it. And we've all got bad eggs in the family, haven't we? Not my family. We're all great. <laughs> Mum's here. Better be careful. But we've all got bad eggs. But they are still connected, are they not? They can still be connected. Okay, then what happens in Chronicles, they then go to the 12 tribes of Israel. He's trying to show a lots of connections. We're not going through it. That's in chapter 2. Okay, I'm going to read it to you, and hopefully Tim might find it. The sons of Israel were Reuben, Simeon. Are we getting there? Go back. There you go. The sons of Israel were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Natali, Gad, and Asher. And they're going about the 12 tribes of Israel. And even the Natali are in there, and they shouldn't be. And I'm not going to go into now why, but you need to understand again, Chronicles is trying to show us something about history. If you go to the beta on the Bible course, I'm sure Kevin might help you understand why. Yes, Kevin? Thanks very much. Good. The point that the chronicler is trying to make is that actually you are a nation that is attached to these glory days that this all happened. And we could go through this. I could get Timmy to keep tapping away. And each time a Jewish person reads a name or whatever within Chronicles, they hear glory. They understand these are the glory days that God was involved, that God was establishing his kingdom through his people. Chapter 5. It's all right, Timmy, don't, because I think the computer's going to blow up. <laughs> Chapter 5, it goes on of just constantly then listing all the names of the different descendants of the different sons of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then it will then go to, in chapter 5, and it then lists these mighty warriors at various points through each of it. There is a key, key understanding here. And now I've lost the bit I wanted to find. No, it's gone. Jabez is in here as well. Oh, well. Are you with me so far or not? Are you bored? Good. Okay. So the genealogies are showing us where God is involved at all the times. And we heard in the testimonies today about God's involvement in everyday life. Yes? Well, funny enough, in these chronicles, it's exactly the same thing. Because if you go through these first nine chapters, there is lists of occupations where God clearly is involved in everyday life. The occupations involves kings, not an everyday life thing. 
warriors, priests, Levites, musicians for the temple, gatekeepers, craftsmen, linen workers, even concubines are mentioned. Not I'm advocating being a concubine. <coughs> Pottery makers. And actually, if you look at the first nine chapters and you break it down, it's, the chronicler is trying to show us that God is bothered about the everyday life of each of us. We had testimonies about healing, the big stuff that we see is the big stuff, healing from cancer, yeah? And we suddenly, some of us will sometimes think, well, God's not worried about my backache. Or no, God's not worried about that awkward colleague I've got that I see occasionally at work. Or God's not worried about this family situation over here that's really minor in the grand scheme of things. There's people with bigger issues going on than me. Actually, God is bothered. God is bothered, and that's what it shows here in Chronicles. God always at work in history. And if God wasn't involved in our history and our everyday life, those big things couldn't happen. Once read a uh, story uh, years ago, I remember it, and it, and it actually made me giggle because it was based on one Chronicles. <laughs> The, I don't remember the name of the person, I remember the, just the, the book, and he was in great distress, he was going through real turmoil, um, I think he was a church leader or something, um, and he was just finding life just absolutely difficult, it had been going on for months and months and months, he was almost at sort of ground zero, I think got to that point of not believing that God really particularly liked him very much, and all this sort of stuff, and God wasn't really that bothered. And he got to that point of absolute despair, so God, you're going to have to show me something in your word that tells me that you're with me and you love me. So he did one of these things that sometimes I won, and he, what was it? He was still doing his, that was it. He was still doing his daily Bible reading, and his daily Bible reading for that day was one Chronicles chapter one, two, and three. So you want to hear from God. Who tends to want to hear from God so much? You want to go to Psalms, don't you? Psalm 91, you know, those who make the Lord their refuge will be sheltered in the most high, yes? Or you want Psalm 23, yeah, he'll lead me beside quiet waters, yeah? You really want to hear from God, yeah? You want Ephesians 6, you know, it's not against flesh and blood, but against, yeah? Want to hear from God? 1 Chronicles, chapter 1, 2, and 3. Well... Apparently, the way you said, I can imagine how, I know how I'd feel, let's put it that way. Be like, this is not what I want to hear. So, but he started reading it anyway, faithfully. Actually, that's quite interesting. Even when you're at your lowest time with God, still remaining faithful to read his word, even though you really don't feel like it, it's actually a good discipline for a lot of us, including myself, to learn. But he read it. And as he read it, he thought, oh, these names. But as he read it, felt God say to him, your name is included in that list, which means you're part of my family, which means you're in the bigger picture. God was bothered. God just showed it by reading this. So, I would like you to, homework for this week, read 1 Chronicles, chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 9, verse 44. Why are you laughing? Have I not sold it? John, have I sold it now? Say yes. Oh, don't bother. One Chronicles shows us this. The whole of the first chapters, chapter 9, shows us that actually when we read this and these glory days that had happened, that should inform our future 
And that's what he was trying to tell the Israelites. Look at the glory days. You think God's not around? No, 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 he is. Because all these people made mistakes along the way, like Ishmael and Isaac, yeah? Yet God was still involved. And that should inv inform your future. And that's what this is about. So with that guy who read it and felt God in it, it informed his future that God really did care and God was really involved. God may not answer the prayers we, the way we like, but it doesn't mean that God is not involved because he's got a better plan sorted. There is a bigger picture. There is a bigger picture. So then when we get to uh, 1 Chronicles 7.14. No. I'm having a good day today trying to find stuff. But if we get to that point where it says, if my people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray, and I will hear on high. Yes. That's because it's about being obedient. God will then hear and heal their land. Don't forget these Israelites were sent into exile. They're coming back. They disobeyed God. Why are they continuing? Because they've obeyed God. Because God is then, they've humbled themselves and returned. And it's a remembrance that to follow God, God has got the bigger picture. That should inform your future. Actually, it was interesting, I'm, I'm just going to say, which is in one of the testimonies there that was said, you know, they prayed, and look how God answered it. It should teach us something about prayer. And that's what Chronicles is about here. It's also showing us how God is involved in our prayers. In Romans, Paul makes it very clear that we Gentiles are grafted into the vineyard. We're grafted in when we come to follow Jesus. So we are part of that rich heritage. So you can read this knowing that you are part of this rich heritage. If you obey God. If you follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. So therefore then, I just want to end this for today. And I want to end faithfully for Belinda on Deuteronomy 7.9. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his command. When you please start reading 1 Chronicles, realise how much God is saying to you, I'm just as faithful to you as I was back to those generations and the future generations. May not always feel like it, but he is. Amen? Amen. Take a few moments just to close your eyes. Lord, I actually want to thank you. Lord, I want to thank you for Chronicles. If I'm honest, Lord, probably 10 years ago, that'd be the last thing I would have thought I would be praying for. But Lord, it is in your word. It is part of your word, and therefore we need to take it seriously. Lord, thank you for those first nine chapters that show your hand at work in the lives of your people. 
Lord, help all of us here now who are going through just life. Just life. Lord, I think of one other testament that was given earlier on and just how for all the years that they've been born until today, all they can say is, Baba, thank you. Lord, and this is true in Chronicles, to help us, Lord, to inform our future, our today present, into our future, that you are actively involved. I want you to speak now by your spirit into each and every person here to say, I am involved in your life. I'm there for you. I'm all that you need. And that your faithfulness never, never ends. In Jesus' name, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.